so uh, Marvin Rees, Mayor of Bristol, uh, we really appreciate your time. Uh, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, now, when I look at your CV, one of the things that really stands out is your declaration of Bristol as a, as a city of hope. That's an amazing phrase. Um, where did it come from and uh, what difference does it make to talk in those terms? So it, it actually comes from a number of different places, um, but I do think there's something of the divine about it. So I, I've, I've been grappling with the idea of hope for many years. In fact, I went to, I went to Uganda with Christian Aid a few years ago, and I, and I had in mind then to make a documentary about hope, because okay. my hope there always talks about challenges and often talks about hope. Uh, and so I, you know, back in the early noughties, I was thinking about hope. But when I first ran for mayor, I was wary about talking about it because I thought they'd think I was trying to be a you know, pound lamb Barack Obama running in the Bristol mayor. So I, I totally avoided that. Um, so I had this idea and then I would meet with um, a small group of church leaders uh, uh, each month in the lead up to the election, uh, including Rob Scott Cook. And mm -hmm. after I was, Rob Scott Cook was saying, look, I think we should declare Bristol a city of hope. I really feel this is right. And I said, yeah, but I've got some concerns about what it could mean for me politically. Um, and then uh, we had an event and I found myself talking about we don't, we, we're Bristol being a city of resilience. We've got a resilient strategy. And I, in that meeting, quite spontaneously or whatever, I, I said, we shouldn't despise our sufferings because suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character and character hope. And that's not just for an individual, that's for a collective. Right? We only understand our character as a place when we've overcome something, hmm. COVID, lost the living crisis child hunger we work together and that's how we find our hope but into I, I found actually found a, a card I'm, I'm moving house at the moment and I found an old letter written to me uh, a long long time ago I would say probably about 15 16 years ago before Bristol even had a mayor and in that letter someone wrote Marvin I think you're going to do something insignificant in Bristol you're going to make it a city of hope wow quite profound right yeah yeah and um, alongside that, I've also seen, um, I guess it's something you've spoken about, building a compassionate city, which must have been a challenge over the last years with austerity. How does being compassionate as a city work out when it comes to making those tough decisions? Well, we've just, we've, we've asked the city to be a number of things, uh, compassionate, gracious, kind. Uh, and, and actually it's worked out incredibly well because, uh, at times of great trial, that's when those those characteristics, those behaviour choices are most needed, isn't it? And they become most visible. There's a, is it Evan Almighty, the movie where um, Morgan yes. Freeman meets the mum in the cafeteria. Yeah, yeah. You think if God, if you ask for love, you know, or the characteristics, if you ask you to be forgiven, do you think he just gives you forgiveness or does he give you the opportunity to forgive? Yeah. There's a whole series. So if we want to be compassionate, do we just get compassion or do we mm. get the opportunity? to be compassionate and all the challenges that we are we have faced and we are going to face as places the real political economic challenges that we're going to face over the coming years will give us that opportunity to live up to that but we make the call and the city sets the standard you can't force people to do it all you can say is this is the best of who we could be uh, but we found people stepping up to that all over the city you, you know right. places can't be run by local government alone they never have been and they never will be um the, the best we can be is a provider of some services, but a convener. Mm. And then city leaders call people to, you know, higher ways of living. So we're gathering in this um, conference called Renew Oxford, asking the question, what can the churches in particular or Christians in the city of Oxford do to step up? You're saying it's not just the local authority, uh, but everyone needs to step up. I've heard it said that as mayor, you provided kind of air cover somehow that encouraged churches to step up and to make a better contribution to the good of the city is that something is that something you set out to do or did it just happen that way well i did set out to do it but it also came out that way often you know sometimes your third step is revealed when you've taken your second isn't it yeah um, so uh, it's just come that way no i mean my, my relationship with the church in bristol is is a long one and comes with a with an offer and an ask uh, I grew up in Bristol, uh, you know, I would say the church was a pivotal intervention in my life, it gave me a sense of purpose, uh, belonging, eternity, hope, um, that, that fueled me through the challenges I faced, you know, as a, as a child. And then I joined Tear Fund straight out of university, 
after studying the politics of black America as a master's and I was fully immersed in the role of the church mm. in political outcomes. And, and look, I studied politics of black America. The, the sequence of what I would call them evils, whether you call it genocide Native Americans, you know, and, or what happened, you know, the enslavement of African Americans could not have happened in the United States without a silence or endorsement of the church. Mm. But at the same time, you see the church coming through uh, in, in the 60s, uh, well, right throughout, but you think about the civil rights movement with Dr. King and um, Southern, um, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, really challenging that. And then you get a split, right? King saying, who do you worship? Who is your God? Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've had that in my mind and always thought that is the fullness of the role of the church, particularly coming from a background like mine where I was poor. I, I said to the church this, right? It's no point turning up to God and praying and asking for miracles uh, when the answers are in our hands. Mm. It, it, you know, God said, you know, what, what happens when we face God one day? We say, why didn't this bad thing happen when it was a result of political policy? God says, well, I gave you a massive organization. You know, I gave you brains and I gave you a reasonably functioning democracy. If you chose not to line up all those things to get better, good, better social outcomes, then, you know, why are you coming to me asking for a miracle? The miracle is the church getting organized, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and shaping for good social policy. Hmm. That's challenging. Great, a great challenge for us to hear. Have, uh, and I sound, probably sense a bit of frustration in what you're saying there, that churches seem to find that hard to do, not only um, in the States, but, but here as well. Are there, are there any um, good news st stories or instances where you've seen things where churches have got their acts together to make a positive difference? Oh, massive. I mean, it's been throughout history, isn't it? Many of our and listen, I just don't want to, I don't want to ignore this. There's a real danger of churches getting involved too, right? Um, okay. and, and listen, and, and we've got to have these conversations. I, I think some of the politics that have come out of the church has been pretty toxic, in particular mm -hmm. for other persons, has caused a bit of an issue for me in my relationship uh, with the church over the years, not with God, but with the institution and of how it's mm -hmm. functioned. Um, but uh, yeah, the church has been massively, whether you're looking at education and housing in Bristol, our whole feeding Bristol uh, campaign really driven by uh, the churches who set a standard, but they've not kept it in the church. What they've done is become a convener or skills from within the church have stepped out into the city, motivated by their own calling and then convened and worked with and, and been another partner and enabler. Same with um, rough sleeping and homelessness. The churches open themselves up every Christmas. And that started as me asking their organizations working with rough sleepers to make a challenge that mm -hmm. no one who had the ability to accept help would have to spend the night on the street between December the 1st and uh, January the 29th. Mm -hmm. But the church stepped up to say, all right, let's make that challenge. We can define it, uh, we can see it. But again, my challenge to the church is in, in Bristol has been, uh, look, I'm a political leader. If the church comes and starts lobbying me on why I haven't got good stuff done, well then I'm gonna say, well, listen, I'm, I'm a fallen human being in a broken political party, in a broken political system. You're an organization that claims to have the supernatural power of God. Show me how you did it, right? The church should be an example of getting these done in the power of God, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean that it, 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 lets, it lets governance and government organizations off the hook, not at all. But just lobbying without doing is not prophetic. Mm -hmm. You know, the prophets came and gave advice and guidance, didn't they, as well? Yeah. And a few minutes ago, you used the phrase something like a big offer and a big ask. That sounds like quite a key way of fostering better relationships. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so actually it's part of a kind of a gracious, the gracious approach we've asked for in the city. Uh, so, you know, I would say, look, I can line up a thousand and twenty nine people around City Hall who have got asking me for something. And then this one person responded to all those asks. But that doesn't work. It's not sustainable. So we've we framed the culture in Bristol, which is when you come to see me or anyone else, make a big offer. What's your big offer to Bristol? Right. Mm -hmm. And then make a big ask. What do you need from the city? Me as the mayor or anyone else to release that offer into the city. And it means we're all dealing with outcomes and we're dealing with action and dynamism. And, mm -hmm. I, and, and actually, it, it means actually people's come with a servant spirit, doesn't it? Because you know, so, yeah. I'm coming to you with an offer rather than a, a requesting, uh, you know, approach. And, and I tell you, I, I think it really has moved the city on because you hear people constantly repeating that rhythm in their engagement with other people in the city. 
that's that's really um, great. And it'd just be good, to, as I said um, to you before we started the call, to just dig into a couple of areas, one being housing. Uh, Bristol has challenges with housing. Oxford has challenges with housing as well. Um, I understand that in your campaigning for mayor, um, housing was a big issue. And you made a big difference in the area of housing as well. So it'd just be good to hear a little bit about that and what you see as the impact on people's lives from that improvement in housing provision. Well, I think housing is one of the single most significant policy tools we have. Um, building homes that are affordable to access and then affordable to run so that people aren't choosing between heating and eating, so that yeah. homes are stable communities uh, where people can get to know their net, net and get to know their neighbours, uh, build relationships, break down social isolation, it are, are, are massive. They'll determine our health outcomes to a large degree, other factors mm. as well, but amongst those biggest determinants. So we set about housing. We have a housing waiting list of 16,000 um, in the city and one of the least affordable cities among the poor cities. But we, we just, we've made it clear that we want to build homes. We've built 9,000 since I've come in and we're committed now to building 2,000 a year, at least 1,000 affordable from 2024 on. So we're building up to that. But some really innovative schemes. There's a really good guy in Bristol, uh, Jess Sweetland, um, uh, now goes to Hope and sat on the Archbishop of Canterbury's Housing Commission uh, mm -hmm. alongside uh, come, is, is looking at off-site manufactured homes, all these new technologies of getting homes built. But there is, as a mayor or as a leader, and, and I would say as a church leader, because the challenge is how the church uses its land resources and expertise to actually get involved in housing delivery as well, for real. Yeah. Um, there is nothing better than visiting a family who have a home for the first time. I've done that. And you just think everything in that family's life has just gone in the right direction. There was a family... Yeah. Young girls left a tower block, they got a garden, they got solar panels, mm -hmm. the likely success of their marriage, educational performance of their children, mm -hmm. their mental health, their freedom from poverty. Um, so I, I think churches getting involved in housing, if you look at the Archbishop of Canterbury's Housing Commission report, could be a real inspiration yeah. for that. Yeah, and I'm encouraged to know that there, there are a few such projects starting to bubble around uh, the city of Oxford uh, and look forward to, see, to seeing more coming from that. I guess one of the things that is likely to lie ahead for us, and you've probably seen a bit of this, is there's, there's really strong financial interests in housing, mm -hmm. uh, likely to be an area where there's conflict to be faced. Uh, have you got anything to say about uh, to us about how to handle that kind of conflict in a, I mean, pardon the pun, but constructive manner? Well, when, when there has been conflict, I mean, it's not, there are some that you can't avoid, but I come into conflict with people all the time now, don't I? <laughs> It's a function of getting things done that you bump into people and they say, you know, we don't want it done, right? If you don't do it, you won't end up in conflict. Um, but I, I, one of my points is let's not start at a point of disagreement. Let's move back upstream and try to work out if we're trying to get the, the same thing done mm -hmm. and work out if our difference is a difference of values, um, aims and objectives, or if it's just a difference of strategy. Okay. Right? Yeah, and, and, and actually that gives us a framework for finding out if there is actually any common ground that we can come mm. together and get some understanding if it's a difference of strategy that we can have a conversation around which is the best you know which is the best strategy um but where, where conflicts unavoidable then i guess and i and i've come into those situations the best defense you've got or the best energy you've got in that conflict is to have really thought it through um and make sure you've got a proper evidence base and and also to and to admit that some days you may you may win as it were a conflict, but in years to come reflect on the fact that you were wrong. <laughs> and that that's the dangers yeah. of being involved in public life, isn't it? We, yeah. we have a heavy dose of humility that um, what's inevitable is like in life is inevitable. Some days you you get things wrong. Mm. Uh, you, that that's that's the price you pay. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and, and just changing tack a bit, um, you're the first person of Black African heritage to be mayor of a major European city. And it mm. just so happens that that's one with uh, major historical links to slavery. Um, yeah. You must have a lot to say about, um, that from what you've seen, you've got this unique vantage point, really, concerning racial justice. Um, you've already said uh, earlier in this conversation that the church really failed in the States um, prior to the civil rights movement. And I, mean, I don't know what you think about American politics now, let's not go there because that's a whole other conversation. But um, I'm just wondering, 
when you look at things in the UK today, what what hope do you have for racial justice? Hmm. By the way, I, I might say the church actually succeeded in the US because I don't think it has always been interested in racial. Okay, all right. Justice. But anyway, um, okay. so I opened up a can of worms for you there. But um, <laughs> hope for racial, racial justice, reconciliation. Listen, I'm mixed race, right? And this has been a big part of my journey, obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, white mum, 1972, brown baby, uh, told if she was a good woman, she'd put me up for adoption. Actually, was told one actually uh, had me aborted, which is the kind of initial piece of health advice. So proper, you know. So I, um, you know, I grapple with with what is reconciliation all the time, mm. and how we get there. I want to talk about race and race inequality because it's real. But I also recognize that my white granddad from Merthyr Tidville did not lead a life of privilege, right? And all these things are true at the same time. So race and class are all the things I'm, um, I'm grappling with. Um, do I, am I optimistic of a time when it's gonna work out and we'll be on the mountain top holding hands? I'm not, no. Um, do I, am I hopeful that we'll keep battling for it? Yes, I am. Uh, but I'm not going to be. I'm not going to pretend that that I think this is a this is an obtainable goal. Um, and part part of my my views of that have really been um, um, energized, if I if I if that's the right word to use in that instance, by the last few years, um, and particularly um, you know with the election of Trump, and you you get the sense that um, the more toxic elements the more toxic politics is always bubbling away just beneath the surface. Right. And in fact, Martin Luther King gave the warning. He said um, that um, there's nothing in the nature of time that means you progress towards kind of higher states of morality. I'm butchering the language here, but I'll use it. And, and I think people lazily assume when it's 2022, it's not mm. 1956 anymore, you know, we've moved on. But there's nothing in the nature of time that means we move to higher states of morality. Mm. Um, in fact, it, it, it feels to me that the only thing that keeps us safe is the constant fight, right? And that in fact, maybe we bend towards chaos more than we bend towards, or bend, bend towards injustice more than bending towards uh, justice. So it's a daily battle, I think. Yeah, and um, gathered as we are at this Renew Oxford conference that's coming from different churches across the city, one of the things that we'll be reflecting on, I'm sure, is that um, most of the, the Church congregations in the city are, are very largely white or mostly white. There's a few that are really multi-ethnic. And then there's been um, lots and lots of new churches that have sprung up, um, being planted to serve different immigrant communities, different languages, different cultures. Um, and I guess I, I wonder, and I wonder what you think about the extent to which it's important for those church communities to build bridges with one another and what kind of role that can play? So look, I, I'm, I'm feeling compromised because I'm remote. So I might set a few hairs running and listen, again, in the spirit of what I said earlier on, I might be wrong. Listen, I'm the living embodiment of racial reconciliation, aren't I? I it's, it's in my blood. Mm. I read Welsh, English on one side, uh, white, and then black Jamaican, um, you know, on the other. So yes, we do need to do physical integration and hang out and eat each other's food and, and, and all those types of things that makes us feel good. Mm -hmm. and, but my challenge is that the quality of our relationship can never be true, can never be truly reconciled without, an econom without addressing economic and political and health inequalities. So this morning on the radio, uh, there was a story of black and Asian women being treated unequally during pregnancy, uh, you know, and more of them dying and worse health outcomes and worse experiences. Now that's not that there's an evil individual uh, driving that, right? There'll be lots of complex dy dynamics around that. But while that's the case, mm -hmm. my suggestion is the ability for us to be reconciled in a real meaningful way is limited. Now, that doesn't mean that my relationship with my mum is compromised or my relationship with my white wife or one of my best friends who's white is compromised. It just means there's a context that puts a little bit of grit in that, that relationship. So, and I think to me, it's like, it's, it's like the year of Jubilee, right? Reconciliation with God wasn't abstract of economic inequalities. God said every 50 years, I want to flatten society, right? I've got to deal with these economic inequalities, right? That drive exclusion. So we cannot, 
deal with reconciliation simply as emotional engagement. We get together, we sing together, we pray mm -hmm. together. We, you know, we ask for forgiveness as a symbolic act, and then we go home and I'm going to categorize here. The wealthy white people go back to, you know, the nice high performance schools and, you know, houses with driveways and garages. And then all the migrant communities go back to the, the hostel. It doesn't, that's not going to work. Mm. Um, so we have to get very gritty very quickly with questions of economic inequality and political power inequalities as well. Mm. Otherwise, it's just superficial. No, no, actually, that's yeah. a bit hard. It, it isn't superficial for the individual. Um, the de but the danger is we end up sim um, substituting in symbolic acts for what 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 for when what is needed actually are good public policy uh, and and a change in the way the economy works. Yeah, and um, suppose I've got um, some um, white Christians listening to this and watching this and thinking, well, that that could feel like. That's beyond their power. They, they can campaign for change. They can join in campaigning for change. They can't be confident of affecting change. Um, should they hold back from making the best friendships that they, they can? Presu presumably not. You're not saying that these things, like one waits for the other. No. Uh, no, no. I mean, this, and this is where it's difficult, right? Because I, I, I think often it's, it, the, the thing that comes through most to me about being the mayor, and I've always thought it anyway, is just the world is complicated and full of contradiction, right? So, um, do I feel warm when I see people kind of hanging out just, you know, as friends? Yes, I do. And do I think that's important? Yes, I do. Do I think it is massively important? Yes, it is. And can it make all the difference to an individual who's on the receiving end of that friendship? Yes, it does, right? Could be the world and, and actually going through my old school reports <laughs> recently it was a it was a white teacher who made a massive intervention for me i'm still friends with actually that saved me from a naughty kid to a kid who started to try and work hard changed my life right one of the interventions massively significant at the same time it's nothing it, 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 it it's not enough as it were so it is everything and it's not everything all at the same time and, and to me, that's just one of the features of living in a fallen world. And one of the agonies of being someone who wants to make real meaningful change. What we do is everything and what we do is never enough. Mm. Yeah, and it, it strikes me listening to you that whether it's in the area of race or of housing or any kind of consideration of the city, there is that complexity. And what I'm just loving um, hearing from you is in the face of that complexity, still being up and at it still seeing what kind of difference can be made, still determined to make the contribution that you can. And so I mean, just as we're coming into land, really, I want to say thank you for contributing that to us, uh, us here in Oxford. Uh, there will be many of us here, I'm sure, who would be um, sort of um, brought to a standstill in the face of some of that complexity. And so to hear some of your passion, your drive and your track record of, of having pushed on through that is, is gold dust for us. Um, really grateful for your time. And um, last question, is there anything that we, you would like us in Oxford to try and send back some blessing the other way to you in Bristol? Is there anything that you, we could do to pray for the city of Bristol? Yeah, well, I'm not going to claim I was a blessing to you today. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have. No, it might not tell you well anyway. But, I, the cha um, challenges of, what is it? What does the proverb say? You know, um, the wounds of a friend are welcome. I mean, you've spoken truth. Um, and you've challenged us, so I'm 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 grateful. Well, the way I, the the way I see it at this moment in time, as I said, I might come and think, oh God, I wish I hadn't said that, or I could have finessed that a little bit more. Um, so just be gracious to me on that front, and and make space and make space for that. But but I am I do want a reconciliation. No, I, I think the key thing is I'd ask for two things. One is obviously for my own wisdom, right, in the middle of a load of contradiction and hypocrisy and, and and my own too. Like I said, you know, most human beings are full of contradiction and hypocrisy. When you put hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people together in a space and give them a couple of thousand years of history, that's gonna be the reality of our collective being. Um, okay. And the second yeah. is that we have good relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, good relationships in the city between uh, business, unions, faith groups, local government, health, absolutely essential to, 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 to running this place. Mm -hmm. Cities are collective acts. They're not the product of any single person or organization's 
uh, decisions. So how we work together collectively will determine whether our city is good or less good for the people that um, live there.